Hello everyone, we're here today to talk about puberty in animals. This is a super important milestone in animal management systems because puberty is, to summarize the Sanger textbook, the process of acquiring reproductive competence, and the main goal of most management systems is to breed as many animals as they can, though, of course, different management systems are breeding for different reasons. In this video, we'll be going through different markers for the onset of puberty, the age at which puberty occurs in different species, the differences between males and females at the level of the brain, how puberty occurs in both males and females at the hypothalamic level, and different factors that may affect the onset of puberty. There are many different ways to define the onset of puberty in both females and males. In females, you could describe puberty as the age at first heat, the age at first ovulation, or the age at which a female could successfully support a pregnancy without harming herself. The third definition is most commonly used because it's really the whole goal of the process. The first definition has the problem of silent ovulation, or ovulation without behavioral signs of being in heat, which is common in the first ovulation for heifers or ewes, and the second definition is useful, but it requires frequent monitoring, which just isn't possible, so the third definition is the most practical for most production systems. In males, puberty can be defined as the age when they begin to exhibit reproductive behavioral traits, the age at first ejaculation, the age when sperm first appear in the ejaculate, or the age when the ejaculate contains the threshold number of sperm. The first definition is easy to observe, as mounting and erection are very visible signs of reproductive behavior. However, these animals still may not have the ability to fertilize a female. The second and third definitions demonstrate more maturity than the first definition, but there still may not be enough sperm to fertilize, meaning that the animal is not quite reproductively competent yet. Thus, the fourth definition is usually the best practical definition of puberty in males. There's no set timeline for puberty, and it greatly differs among species and, often, among the breeds within those species. You probably won't need to know, for example, the average age of puberty in a male chihuahua off the top of your head, but it doesn't hurt to have a couple of baselines in your head to understand when an animal that you handle frequently may be undergoing puberty. It is important to note that the average age of puberty doesn't necessarily mean the best time to begin a breeding program with these animals. A successful breeding program may have to start with animals that are reproductively competent, i.e. have undergone puberty, but there are many other factors in that animal that lead to a successful breeding. Here are some average ages for puberty in the males and females of a couple of different common species you may be working with, including ourselves. For comparison, and to illustrate the point mentioned before, I will also include for some of the species the age at which you would probably begin breeding the animal. All of these values are coming directly from Dr. Campos's PowerPoints, which mostly take from Table 6-1 in the Sanger book. I won't waste your valuable time simply listing these values, but hopefully you'll take the time to pause the video and check out these values so you at least have a ballpark idea of when these animals become reproductively competent. We have to talk a little bit about brain development before we can discuss how puberty occurs in the male and the female. The part of the brain that we'll be looking at in particular is the hypothalamus, which is outlined here in pink. In utero, the male and female fetuses will be producing different hormones, which have different interactions with the blood-brain barrier, which helps control what has access to the brain. It's outlined here in blue. The female fetus produces estradiol, which I'll label here as E2. Estradiol is a steroid hormone, so it could cross the blood-brain barrier, except it is bound to alpha feta protein, which I'll label here as alpha FP, in the fetus, which prevents it from crossing that blood-brain barrier. This allows the brain to develop at the default setting, for lack of a better phrase, which is to maintain the tonic center, which is labeled here in this very pale green, right here. And it also allows the creation of the surge center, which is right about here, labeled in darker green. The surge center is essential for the estrous cycle in female animals once they hit puberty, and it plays a large role in puberty itself. Male fetuses produce testosterone, which I'll label here as T. Alpha fetoprotein does not bind to testosterone. Since testosterone is a steroid hormone, it is now at liberty to diffuse through the blood-brain barrier into the brain. Testosterone is aromatized in the brain into estradiol, which is then free to affect transcription in the brain cells. It allows the tonic center to continue developing and being nourished, but prevents the development of the surge center. Thus, the defining difference between males and females that we are going to pay attention to is that females have a surge center 
and males do not. Now let's look at puberty in the male. They'll be a little easier to explain as you only have to think about what's going on with the tonic center in the hypothalamus. Now, we've established that male puberty can be functionally defined as the age at which the male can produce a threshold number of sperm. To produce sperm, the male needs to have a high intratesticular testosterone. The way that this testosterone is produced is through the hypothalamopituitary testicular axis. Hopefully you guys are familiar with this concept, but here's a quick overview. Gonadotropin releasing hormone, or GnRH, is produced from the hypothalamus tonic center and targets the anterior pituitary, which, in response, then releases LH and FSH, which go target the testes, which in response produces our sex steroids, in this case, testosterone and estradiol. Now, here's our most important part of the axis, is our sex steroids. So, our sex steroids create negative feedback on the hypothalamus on the tonic center. This is a normal state of being. It happens in the adult as well. However, before puberty, the hypothalamus is even more sensitive to negative feedback than a normal adult animal. So GnRH is still produced regularly by the tonic center, as it's what the tonic center does automatically, but its production is very easily inhibited by the sex steroids. This means that a very, very small amount of estradiol and testosterone will inhibit GnRH production. And if GnRH production is inhibited, testosterone and estradiol will remain low. However, as puberty approaches, there is a decreasing sensitivity of the hypothalamus to negative feedback. If the hypothalamus of the male, particularly the tonic center, is less sensitive to negative feedback, that means it takes more estradiol and testosterone to inhibit GnRH production. So GnRH will continue to be secreted, and estradiol and testosterone will continue to build up. Eventually, this sensitivity will decrease to the point that enough GnRH can be produced to produce enough LH and FSH to produce enough estradiol and testosterone for normal testicular function and sperm production. This male animal has now been through puberty and is reproductively competent. All right, so now that we've looked at the male, we can look at puberty in the female. The confusing part about the female is that we need to look into not only negative feedback, but positive feedback as well. So, you guys just saw the hypothalamopituitary testicular axis. Now we're going to look at the hypothalamopituitary ovarian axis, which is just a little bit more complicated for our purposes. So mainly what we're going to be looking at here is estradiol. Testosterone isn't um, produced in large amounts in females. So like in males, we do have estradiol having negative feedback. In particular, it does have negative feedback on our anterior pituitary. Ooh, and that is a very large pen. Give me one second. So we have negative feedback of estradiol on our anterior pituitary. But something that's really important to note is that when it hits a threshold level, it has positive feedback on our surge center, causing a flood of GnRH. This is actually what causes ovulation in postpubertal females. So estradiol rises, hits the threshold to activate positive feedback on the surge center. So the surge center releases huge quantities of GnRH, which stimulates the release of huge quantities of LH, which causes ovulation. So getting enough estradiol to trigger this surge center is obviously a big part of puberty in females. Now, you may think that what happens is that a female animal approaches puberty and her surge center becomes more sensitive to positive feedback by estradiol. In fact, even in the prepubescent animal, the surge center is very, very sensitive to positive feedback by estradiol, but only past that threshold level. So the reason why the surge center is never stimulated in the prepubescent animal is that the tonic center, like in the male, is very sensitive to negative feedback by estradiol. So as the female undergoes puberty, the tonic center has a decreasing sensitivity to negative feedback by estradiol, once again just like in the male, which allows more GnRH and thus more FSH and LH to be secreted, which allows more estradiol to be produced by the follicle. Estradiol can then reach the threshold and activate the surge center, which causes a flood of GnRH, thus a surge of LH, and ovulation, as mentioned earlier. And voila, 
we have a postpubertal female who should hopefully be cycling and producing normal follicles. The last thing we'll go into acknowledging is that there are other things that affect the onset of puberty, particularly in females. As we want the animals to go into puberty as quickly as possible as their purpose is reproduction, we can take advantage of these factors. One of the ones that we can really, really monitor is the nutritional requirement. Remember, reproduction is the only body system that animals can essentially turn off when it is de detrimental for their survival to expend energy on it. Energy correlates to nutritional status, so in order to expend energy initiating puberty and thus reproductive competence, they must have adequate nutrition. We are in fact finding that there is, as the Sanger book says, a certain degree of fatness required before puberty will occur. The hypothalamus receives information about blood glucose, fatty acids, and leptin levels in order to determine whether GnRH secretion should be changed to help stimulate puberty. Remember, leptin is a hormone produced by adipose cells and is correlated with amounts of body fat. So, it's unknown exactly how the brain senses the levels of these metabolic signals, but it is suspected that kiss peptins are involved or that GnRH neurons could directly sense these levels. I've reproduced a picture here of what we currently hypothesize could be the method of signaling. This is figure 6-7 from the third edition of the Sanger book. So essentially, blood glucose, leptin, and fatty acids, as indicators of nutritional status, somehow influence the secretion of GnRH. Thus, if you want animals to go into puberty in a timely manner, ensure that she has enough nutrition. Puberty also has a seasonality in seasonal breeders. If an animal is a long day breeder, and thus will only cycle in the summer, it wouldn't make sense for them to begin puberty in winter. So, even though in winter they may be reaching the average age for when puberty begins in their species, it would be counterproductive for them to expend that energy then, so they will wait until spring or summer, when the days are getting longer for them to undergo puberty. If you want more information on seasonal breeders and how exactly that's regulated, we'll have another video ready for that. Finally, there are social cues for some animals that can help you decrease the age of puberty. In gilts, if you house them with a male, no matter if there's physical contact or not, they will experience puberty at about 24 weeks, which is about a month earlier than the normal age of puberty that occurs when large gilt groups of gilts are put together. Conversely, if you house them in small groups, they will experience delayed puberty by about a month, meaning they'll go at about 32 weeks. Thus, if you want puberty to occur sooner, house them in larger groups where they are around males. This can also be seen in beef heifers who reach puberty earlier when exposed to a bull. All right, so now that we've described what puberty is, how it happens in males and females, and the different factors that affect its onset, hopefully you understand the process and why it's important to understand puberty. Hope you enjoyed the video and happy studying.